Both of these motors are made to spin propellers. This one spins if you connect the two wires to electrical power. The one with three wires, well, let's just say it requires a lot more. Both types of motors spin, but this one wins out big, even if this was the same size. So what's so special about the extra wire? Boiled down, motors are two things, magnets and coils of wire. You probably know that magnets can attract metal objects, as well as other magnets. If we made one magnet stay put, but still able to spin, it would rotate so that the opposing sides of both magnets come close together. If we had another magnet on the left side that is facing the same direction as the right magnet, then the middle magnet will align itself much faster because its north is pulled right and its south is pulled left at the same time. Turns out, coils can function as magnets if electricity runs through them, like from a battery when connecting both ends of the battery to the ends of the coil. If we put some iron through the coil, it increases the strength of the magnet that it acts as, allowing us to attract metal objects and other magnets. If we reverse the direction of electricity, then the imaginary magnet is flipped. If we stop electricity from flowing through the coil, then the coil doesn't act as a magnet anymore. If we replace the middle magnet in this example with the coil, then whenever electricity runs through the coil, it will align itself so that the opposite poles are closest together. This is pretty much all you need to know to understand motors. I know they seem like these magical boxes that spin things, but let's get rid of everything except the magnets and coils. And after taking off all the scary looking stuff, it's not too bad. This motor comes with three coils and two curved magnets. Magnets can come in any shape, so these magnets have a north and a south pole like any other magnet. The three coils are meant to function as magnets when electricity runs through them. So let's run some electricity through these connections here with the positive of the battery on the left and negative on the right. The electricity goes through the brushes, this metal pad, this coil, and out the other end of the motor. This makes the coil with electricity through it act as a magnet, aligning itself to the curved magnets. But look, the metal pads also spin, making this metal brush touch another pad. Because of that, it runs electricity through the next coil, repeating the cycle and spinning continuously. Add an iron core to strengthen the coil's effects, and attach the shaft to the spinning coils and you have a motor. This kind of motor is called a brushed motor because it uses metal brushes to brush up against the metal pads to change which coil gets electricity. The first brush motor was made in the 1830s and for over 100 years this was how we used electricity to spin things. But then something happened in the 1960s. The modern day computer was being born and it was forged in silicon basically sand. We made it think and gave it the ability to control things. So if brushes of a motor control which coils receive electricity at certain times, and semiconductors can be used to control things and do computations, can we replace brushes with semiconductors? Combining semiconductor tech, something seen as only useful for computers, with motors is the genius idea that led to the brushless motor, leading to great technological benefits which we'll see later. As you'd expect, it looks like a brushed motor, but without any brushes. However, this particular motor has the coils staying put, while the magnets are the ones spinning around. Still the same concept of coils acting as magnets to create motion, however. The magnets are placed around in alternating directions, meaning adjacent magnets are facing opposite directions. These three wires are each connected to a set of coils, which are four coils connected one after the other. So passing electricity through one set makes all four coils in that set act as a magnet. Let's use A, B, and C to see which coils are connected to which wires. These sets of coils are connected like this, meaning one end of each coil is connected outside to a wire, and the other end is connected to every other coil. We'll use this to pass electricity through one set and out the other set. So let's say that electricity goes into set A, making each coil act as a magnet with north facing in. Now let's make electricity come out of set C so that the coils act as a magnet with north facing out. This is because electricity in set C is going out while in set A it's going in, and reversing the direction of electricity reverses the direction of the magnet that the coil acts as. So to sum it up, electricity in, north in, 
and electricity out, north out. So let's play with electricity to get this thing spinning. Let's focus on the two outer magnets here to see how they go around. The A and C coils act as magnets with opposing directions. This makes the outer magnets move counterclockwise because these two outer magnets are attracted to these two coils. Let's run electricity into set B and out of set C. Making set B coils act as magnets with north facing in and C as it was before. This will cause the magnets to move counterclockwise again. This process continues with the next being running electricity into B and out of A. Then into C and out of A, into C again and out of B, and finally into A and out of B. After this, we'd come back to the original phase, which is electricity flowing into A and out of C. But how would we know when to switch where electricity goes? Notice how we only run electricity through two of the three wires. The third wire can be used to know when we need to switch the phases. We can run electricity through a coil to move a magnet, but we can reverse that as well. If a magnet moves near a coil, then we have electricity running through it. Specifically, we create something called voltage through the unused coil, which is what pushes electrons creating electricity in the first place. So this voltage here is some positive or negative amount. But look at what happens when the magnet crosses right over the unused coil. The voltage on the unused coil crosses through zero volts, which is when we switch to the next phase. At this point, electricity is magically going through three wires at the right times and the right directions. Of course, in real life, there'd be something to conduct all of this. This is an electronic speed controller, ESC for short, which is able to be made thanks to advancements in semiconductor technology and computer technology. This ESC has a mini computer, some intermediate circuitry to allow these guys called MOSFETs, to connect a coil to a power source's positive or negative side, allowing for the flow of electricity as shown for brushless motors. And yes, I did design and build this ESC myself to figure out how brushless motors work and how to control them. I was able to make this with the help of PCBWay, sponsor of today's video. After designing the schematic and PCB itself, with the press of a literal button that I got by using a plugin for my design software, I could upload the entire design to PCBWay and after selecting the additional options that I need, I was able to make the purchase and get the PCB in about two weeks. I was able to get the PCBs within a week previously, but unfortunately, shipping times have inflated recently, so I chose a slower option. Now, if you're actually patient, unlike me, there are cost-effective shipping options that cost only a few bucks. Being able to get professional PCBs as a hobbyist in small quantities of five, rather than having to buy in bulk like 100, is amazing. You don't need to invest in an at-home PCB fabrication machine or try to use chemicals to make your PCB and pay with your health, which is obviously a big plus. PCBWay can also manufacture your 3D model designs with 3D printing, CNC milling, and injection molding. So now, finally, the question of why brushless motors are a genius idea, and why they are much better than their brushed brothers. Well, as you've seen, there's a lot that goes into spinning a brushless motor. That in of itself is a kind of genius. But what's more important is that it's brushless, the seemingly tiny change that actually leads to many big improvements. All thanks to combining semiconductor tech with motors. No brushes mean that two things aren't rubbing up against each other, so instead of wasting power trying to overcome friction, we can save that for spinning the motor faster. This paves the way for things like electric vehicles, powerful drones, and robots that need to move using electricity. Brushless motors are also simple, and that's good for reliability. Reliability is important for things that need to be infrequently replaced. For example, a Mars rover. You can only replace motors on these for a total of zero times. NASA used to use brush motors on their earlier rovers, but you can imagine that the brushes wear down over time, and combined with the harsh Martian environment, makes it a tough challenge for long missions. Reliability is also important for mundane things like your CPU fan to reduce the need for maintenance. And finally, brushless motors can be controlled in various ways, because it is dictated by some controller, which is often programmed. This can lead to more efficient and powerful methods. Brushless motor control looks complicated at face value, but sometimes taking the risk and trying something more difficult is worth it. On that note, I'm making a homemade drone with brushless motors and my homemade ESC. Risky, yes, but it's worth it since I've grown a lot since my attempt at a drone one year ago. And hopefully I'll take to the skies in the next one.